Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. That at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down, shall the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music. All the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. Verse 11, but whosoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach Meshach and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you will not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But if not, be known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, and their caps, and their other clothes, and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hard, the flame of the fire threw those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, 
Meshach and Abednego fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Did not we cast these three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, He answered and said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shazrak, Meshach, and Abednego, and ye servants of the most high, then come hither, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was there, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor was, nor were their trousers damaged, and had the smell of fire even come upon them. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent to the angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and hath changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, so they might not serve nor worship any god except their own God. Verse 29. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speak against offensive, sorry, that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be turned limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Okay, let us pray. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, this uh, evening we worship you. We praise you. Lord, we thank you uh, for this chapter, this entire book, Daniel. Yes, Lord, you are the most high God. Lord, nothing is outside of your sovereignty. We worship you that you are a sovereign God. You run the affairs of men in accordance to your will. We worship you. We praise you for your might and for your wisdom. Father, this uh, afternoon, as we look into this chapter we pray O oh God that you would speak to us you would uh, prepare us you prepare a people for yourself who would be zealous for your name and Lord who are willing to offer up uh, their lives to you Lord please speak to each of our hearts please make us real Christians genuine Christians please uh, remove Lord all worldliness all taints of sin from our hearts Help us to be devoted only to you, Lord. Please give us grace. Speak to us this uh, evening. I pray for myself. Please give me wisdom. Please give me the thought process to speak the words of life. I pray for your work in our midst. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Yeah. Um, as I was reading through Daniel 3 and preparing for this message, one thing that uh, popped into my mind is, we can say roughly this, this incident happened 2,500 years ago. Roughly 2,500 years ago. But the thing that struck me most is, it's as if it's appearing today. It is happening in front of us today. This very story is happening in front of us today. The characters have changed. The clothing has changed, but the exact same principles are playing out right in front of our eyes. We must not read this chapter uh, as a matter of historic, historical interest. We must not have this uh, antiquarian curiosity, right? This chapter speaks to us today because these very things are happening right in our lives in front of us. 
Daniel chapter 3 is happening in front of us. Now as we go through this chapter, what I would ask you to do is let's say this happens to you. I want you to ask yourself this question, how should I respond? The events that are in this chapter, it's played out in front of me and let's say I am a part of this story. How should I respond? And that's how we are going to learn from this passage. As I outline this passage, I, I, uh, the Lord helped me to simplify this passage this way. So I hope that we can basically remember this passage with these words. The first one, uh, I tried to use the word P, uh, the letter P for, for the entire passage so we can outline it that way. The first one is a propaganda of false religion. A propaganda of false religion. Verses 1 through 7. The propagation of false religion. We're going to go in the details later, but for now I'll just give you the outline so you can hopefully remember as we go through this uh, passage. Verses 8 through 15, the prosecution of the people of God. Prosecution, interrogation, right? Prosecution of the people of God. Verses 8 through 15. 16 through 18, perseverance of the people of God. 16 through 18, perseverance of the people of God. The patience, if you will, of the people of God. Verses 19 through 23, persecution of the people of God persecution of the people of God. Verses 24 through 27. Preservation of the people of God. Preservation of the people of God. Last one, verses 28 through 30. The promotion of the purposes of God. The promotion of the purposes of God. Propagation, prosecution, perseverance, persecution, preservation, promotion. Right? These are the words under which we will study this passage. Like I said, this very cha chapter is right in front of our eyes. We must be blind not to see what's happening. We must be spiritually blind not to realize that Daniel chapter 3 is happening right in front of our eyes. And that's why we have to be careful and listen. Because these people have set a template for us. God desires that we, de we learn from this historical narrative. Let us be attentive. We read at the end of Daniel chapter 2, verse 47. Uh, we read, Nebuchadnezzar, exalting the God of Israel as the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He sees this sovereign God who is ruler over all and he makes this great, if you will, confession. Having understood that his dream could be relayed, at the same time interpreted only by an omniscient God, by an almighty most high God, and this God had given this revelation to Daniel, and in God's plan, he is this kingdom, the head of gold, if you will, in that statue that he saw in the dream. And he glorifies God. He sees that God the Most High has appointed him, given him an umpire, and he is this head of gold in the statue that we studied uh, in Daniel chapter 2. 
days pass. We don't know why, but days pass. And now he takes up a new theology. He undergoes a change in convictions. He says earlier, the God of Israel is the God of gods and the Lord of lords in verse, chapter 2 verse 47. But now, forgetfulness, ungratefulness, whatever may be the reason, he takes up a new position. The position leads him So that in his policy, in his administrative policy, he says there is going to be a state religion. The God whom my father served. We are going to adopt this religion as the religion of the state. You remember Nebuchadnezzar at this point in history, he is ruling over the world. He had all these kingdoms scattered across the earth. He needed to unify them, he needed to administrate them. And here, as his official policy, he is going to have one religion that unites all his people. And so, he's, he's saying, the God whom my fathers worshipped, this religion would be the state religion. And he goes on and he formulates his plan. He formulates the inauguration of this agenda item in his administrative policy. In verses 1 through 7, we see that he sets up this huge statue. We read it is 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. It's, so it's this huge uh, statue that that he makes and he it is an image of gold and he basically sends word to, throughout his uh, kingdom he says every ruler every satrap every prefect, every governor, every counselor, every treasurer, every judge, every magistrate, everybody should come to this dedication when I unveil my policy. Everybody should be participant in this and they must show their loyalty to me by bowing before this huge, uh, huge statue that I'm going to set up. And so he sets up this, he sets up the plan for the inauguration of this event. Not only that, he says, verse 6, Whoever does not fall down or worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. He says, if anyone does not obey, does not bow, does not accept the state religion that I'm imposing, they shall be thrown into a furnace of fire. They shall be put to death. One government, one religion. Anyone who disobeys this will be put to death. If you notice, this particular behavior is not unique to Nebuchadnezzar. In Genesis 11, we read that 
that there was this tower which is called Babel. God tells these um, the people uh, after the flood to multi to expand, multiply, and occupy the earth. What we see in Genesis 11 is men and women come together, verse 4, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So here were men, even after the flood, they had just seen the flood. God had destroyed the, the, if you will, Noahic era because of all the violence, because of all the evil. God brings them out of the flood. God says, go, multiply, occupy the earth, men and women, again, the very exact opposite. They're building this tower that will reach into heaven. They are rebelling in pride. There is this again, this concept called one religion that is set up against God, in rebellion against God. Nebuchadnezzar is doing exactly the same. In rebellion to God, whom he confessed in chapter 2, verse 47, as the God of gods and Lord of lords, now he's setting up another religion directly in rebellion to God, and he's propagating and propaga propagandizing this religion. I told you in the beginning, this story is happening right in front of us. How many agree? Agree or disagree? Most of us are saying, no, we don't agree. You're, you're, you're just imagining. Okay, let's, let's look at it. Take our motherland. Take our motherland. India, right? We have a government now, right? What is one of their manifestos? One of their agenda items in their manifesto? Huh? Hindutva, a false religion against, in rebellion against God. You name any country, you name any country, you would find that particular government is setting up a false religion against the true and living God. another country by the letter I. Endorses Islam as a state religion. And persecutes all other religions. If, any, uh, if they don't comply, they don't comply with the state religion, it persecutes all other people. You say, perhaps America is exempt. We are in a free country, right? Is it true that there is no false religion in this country? There is a religion called humanist secularism. Humanist secularism. Its beliefs are, there is no God. Man is the measure of all things. Let's wipe out the name of God from this country. That's the agenda of this particular religion. And it is embraced by educational institutions. We're talking about all these big colleges we're talking about. We're talking about the Harvards, we're talking about the Yales. Not only these educational institutions embrace this religion and fight against the true and living God, they pump out people 
into the society. And these people who come out of these colleges, brainwashed by this religion called humanist secularism, there is no God. Anyone who mentions there is a God, let us mock him. Let us do whatever we can to silence him. These students who graduate out of these colleges, no, give me, let me take a break. This is the status of the best colleges. It distills down all the way to the lower levels. The entire academic institution in this country embraces this religion called humanist secularism and breeds out people who want to silence anyone who says there is God, there is such thing called truth. You are hearing many times in our worship services, we live in a what culture? Post truth culture. Post truth culture. We live in a post modern culture. What are these words post truth, post modern? Where do they come from? These come as a fruit of the religion people have embraced. And that religion is humanist secularism. Man is a measure of everything. Man decides what is right and wrong. It doesn't matter what God says about anything. It's ultimately what man says is right or wrong, is right or wrong. If, man, if God says anything about marriage, it's invalid. Man is the measure of all things. Man decides what is marriage. In every area, if God says there's only two genders, man, sec humanist secularism goes on to say, who said there is only man, male and female? There are thousand genders, three thousand genders. This fall, these are all fruit of embracing a religion called Real, uh, humanist secularism. Again, let, let's not use the word human secularism. Let's just use this word. Man is the measure of all things. Man is God. Man decides everything. And there is this false religion everywhere in this country. In fact, many are warning. It's only a matter of time before Christians will be persecuted in this country. It's actually happening now. If you go to the campus, any campus in this country, and you say you're a Christian, you're kicked out immediately. If you say as a professor, I am a Christian, you're kicked out immediately. You go to the public schools today, and you tell, you name the name of Christ, your voice is silenced immediately. This is happening right in front of us. The embrace of this false religion called secular humanism and they're fighting the living and true God they want to silence him at all costs I want to remind you Nebuchadnezzar is doing the very thing what we are seeing right in front of our eyes. Establishment of a false religion and its propagation and propaganda. They forget history. Nebuchadnezzar just forgot history. He forgot who, who gave him this kingly rule. Men and women do exactly the same. They don't study history. And they set up false religion against the true and living God. And therefore, as we, as I said, this thing is happening right in front of us and we better heed to the scripture portion. Better be prepared. Don't think, oh, it's not happening to me, it's not relevant, the story is very nice. 
It's coming. Persecution is coming. So let's listen to the scriptures. What we see next is Daniel's friends are administrators in in uh, administrators in in King Nebuchadnezzar's administration. You remember in the um, in chapter two, verse forty-nine. Daniel appointed Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon. These people of God, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, we see because of their commitment to the God of Israel, they do not accept to bow before this false god. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 20 verse, uh, let's read from three, Exodus chapter 20 verses 3, 4 and 5. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God. This is exactly opposite to what God had instituted in the Jewish faith. God had clearly commanded, you shall not worship, you shall not fall down before a false God. You shall not do that. And see, we see here in this chapter, Shidra, uh, these three uh, friends, if you will, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They do not bow. And because they, of their faithfulness, because of their loyalty to the true God, to the living God, they do not bow. And we read, verse 8, Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. Chaldeans came forward and brought prosecution against the Jews and they complained to the king. You, you know these, these in verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon. They do not, uh, th these men, O king, they have disregarded you, they have rebelled against you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. In other words, they do not accept you nor your false religion. That was the complaint. They rebel against you. They do not comply with your, with your decree. They reject your false religion and your false theology. We read the response of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar in rage uh, gave orders to bring them before him. And he goes on to say, I'm going to give you a chance. You know what is at stake, don't you? Your life is at stake. If you, this, I'm going to call my choir again. I'm going to call my, call my worship choir again. They're going to sing this song to the false gods and you need to obey. If you don't obey, I'm going to throw you into the fire. And he goes on to say proudly, verse 15, What God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? What God is there? Total pride rebelling against the living God and challenging what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands. Threatening. If you don't worship, embrace my false religion, I'll put you to death. Again. This is happening right in front of us. 
is it not? A college professor is called in. I hear you're talking about Jesus. You better silence. Be silent, or else you're going to lose your grant. You're going to lose your uh, professorship. You're going to lose all your grants. A teacher is called into the principal's office. I hear you're talking about Jesus. You must not do it. I'm going to terminate your contract if you continue to do this. False religion prosecutes people who belong to the true religion and threatens them and persuades them to give up their faith. In verse 16 through 18, we see the response of the children of God, of the people of God. And here comes the application part. Let's say, I'm, I'm just going to pick on the youth. <laughs> you, you're asked to write a paper. And you want to, you're to asked to write about religion. Right? And you know if you write about your true religion, about your convictions, you'll get an F. Right? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I hope you take the example of these three Christians who are here, or these three children of God who are here. We see the people of God here persevering when they are threatened with execution. They are persevering. We read in 16, 17, 18, that they answer him, this great confession. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this. We don't care who you are. You might be the king, but in this matter, we are not going to listen to you. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us from our, out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your, uh, serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see, uh, these three young men did not know the outcome. Yes, they believed the sovereignty of God. But they did not know for sure if God would deliver them. But yet, they commit themselves to God. God knows well. God knows he has, he has a plan. If he saves us, fine, great. But even if he doesn't save us, we will not bow before this false god. Let's imagine for a minute that these three young men knew God was going to deliver them. Is it easy to, to go into the furnace or not? Absolutely easy, if they knew for sure that God will deliver them. It's easy to go into the furnace because they know for sure God is going to deliver them. But let's say they don't know, which is the case here. Is it easy to go or no? No, it needs faith. 
It needs perseverance. It needs the conviction of Job who says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him, in his sovereignty. Dear ones, when we are faced with these threats from false, from representatives of false religion, what do we do? Do we succumb? Do we say, "I got all the money, I can do whatever"? Okay, in the future, call on just the right? Do we do that, or do we commit ourselves? to the sovereignty of God. Here these young men commit themselves to the sovereignty of God. God is this most high God. He has allowed this difficult circumstance. I will trust God in this difficult circumstance. I will commit myself to His sovereignty. And that's the response you and I need to have when we are faced with threatening from representatives of false religion. Peter says, the Lord is our example for this. Uh, First Peter chapter 2, we, let's turn to 21, 22, 23. Christ was willing to suffer. That's what Peter is, Peter is saying. 21, 22, 23. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. But while being reviled, he did not revile in turn. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. What happens when people threaten to cause you, uh, threaten to cause you pain, suffering? What, what happens when people will say, the professors will say, I'll give you an F if you talk about your religion. You lose your grant if you talk about your religion. What should people do? What should we do when we are persecu when we are threatened? The Lord Jesus did this. He entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. We trust in the sovereignty of God and we give ourselves to God. And we say, God, I don't know, I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose my professorship. I'm going to get an F on my, off on, on my, on my course. But I entrust it to your sovereignty. I give it to you. You are able to work out things for my good. I'm standing for you. I'm standing for truth. I'm showing my loyalty to you. If I lose temporarily, that's fine. I commit myself to your sovereignty. I trust in your sovereignty. And that's what we see these three young men committing themselves to the sovereignty of God against threats to their life. As we move on in this chapter, we looked so far at a propag propaganda of false religion, we looked about prosecution of the people of God, and we see how the people of God in the midst of their prosecution, which is they persevere, they continue in the faith, they commit themselves to this sovereignty of God. As we go on in the next verses, 19 through 23, we see the persecution of the friends, of the three young men here. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. He was filled with wrath, he was filled with anger. You know what happens when you stand against false religion? You know what happens when you stand against false religion? They are filled with wrath. 
anger. They hate you. The Lord Jesus said. Men and women would hate you because of me. Turn to Matthew 10. Verse 22. Matthew 10, verse 22. And you will be hated on, you would be hated by all on account of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. When you stand against false religion, when you say, Christ is the only way when you claim the exclusivity of Christ. Just like Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and rage and anger, men and women who embrace false religion hate you and they will persecute you. This is the cup of all the people of God who have stood for God. You see, when, the, when our Lord was on earth, right? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. What happened to our Lord? They hated Him. They hated Him so much that they were willing to give the worst persecution to Him. They nailed Him to the cross, put Him to death. Persecution is the cup of people who embrace the true religion. Here we see the three, uh, the three uh, young men thrown into the furnace. Let's turn to First Peter, First Peter, chapter four, verse twelve. Peter is writing to Christians in his generation. He says this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. What Peter is saying is, you children of God, beloved, I know you are going through this suffering. But don't think this is strange. This is something out of the norm. In fact, this is the norm. Don't think this is strange. This is normal. He goes on to say in verse 13, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on re rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. Verse 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. Why are you, why are you persecuted? Why is the Christian persecuted? Because the spirit of God is in him. The spirit of glory is in him. The devil cannot take it. He instigates his representatives to, to persecute true believers. Second Timothy, Second Timothy, three, twelve. Second Timothy, three, twelve. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecution is the portion of the Christian. The false religion always hates true, the true God. Since it cannot persecute the true God, it persecutes the representatives of the true God. And here we see 
in Daniel chapter 3 that the king filled with rage asks his 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 servants to maximize the fire how much is the maximum temperature in the furnace how much can we go high unto they say seven times we can do seven times the heat and so they are thrown into the furnace verse 23 we read that these men were tied uh, earlier verses you will see that verse 21 the men were tied the soldiers uh, who brought these three men near the furnace we are told that they are consumed by the heat but these three men verse 23 but three, three these three men um, they fell into the furnace still tied up still tied up again in this instance God desires to rescue his servants or God wills to rescue his servants and we see in verses 24 to 27 how God how God preserves his people how God preserves his people while they were in the furnace while they were in the furnace of affliction God preserves his people we read in verse 20, uh, 24 the king was astounded when he saw the, the furnace and he goes on to say was it not three men we cast into the midst of the fire they answered certainly O king verse 25 he answered and said look I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm and the appearance of the fourth is, a, is like a son of the gods obviously the God in this instant sent heavenly help no, it's a it's a matter of debate whether he is the pre-incarnate Christ or whether he is uh, this fourth person is an angel. It's a matter of debate. Either ways, what we can know for sure is God sent help to His children when they were in the affliction, when they were in the furnace of affliction when they were in tribulation, when they were in this terrible state. And this is what God does when we stand for Him, when we submit ourselves to the sovereignty of God, when we are persecuted. God sends His heavenly help to us. We cannot go through the persecution all by ourselves we are so weak God carries us through this trial period through this persecution period he carries us through this furnace of affliction and throughout the scriptures you see that you remember Joseph remember his life His brothers mistreated him. We read again and again. God was with Joseph. He went to Fortifer's house. He was accused wrongly. He was put in prison. God was with him. The presence of God, when we stand for God, is with us. God sends his heavenly help when we go through periods of affliction. That is the greatest comfort that we have, children of God. He 
here we see in verses 24 to 27 the presence of God the presence of God's of God's hand amidst in the lives of these three people in the furnace there is great comfort for us we are not alone Christ was will carry us through when we go through periods of affliction in our life we read in verses 28 through 30 when these three men walk out of the furnace Nebuchadnezzar exalting the God of Israel in verse 28 we see blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god here is a pagan here is a pagan king making this out of this incident making this confession and glorifying the God of Israel and he goes on and uh, he promotes if you will not this false religion in verse 29 he promotes the Jewish religion in his kingdom he goes on to say I make a decree any people nation or tongue that speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego shall be turned limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. So in other words he kind of uh, promotes the, the Jewish, Jewish faith and not only that he promotes um, these three men in his kingdom. Verse 30 says that the king caused Shedrach, Meshach, Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. When affliction comes and when we stand for him and God carries us through, ultimately God promotes his purposes through it. We must realize that. Many times when we stand for Christ, when we are persecuted, when we stand for Christ, when we go through the trials, people are watching. People are watching you. Why is this guy willing to let go his grant? Why is this guy willing to let go his professorship? Why is this guy willing to get a fail grade on his, on his paper, on his course? Why? Why is Peter willing to give up his life crucified upside down? Why would all the early disciples give up their lives except John for the sake of the gospel? Obviously, if they believed something false, they would not do that. Only if they believed that this faith is true and they were looking for a greater world only then they can do such things many times when we stand for Christ and we are willing to forego the things of this world people see that our faith is genuine people see we are real and they are attracted to this great God it promotes the true religion, the true God in the world. It promotes the purposes of God in this world. Not only that, on a personal level, when we go through this persecution, 
God removes the impurities in our life. Please turn to 1 Peter 4. <coughs> 1 Peter 4. I want us to read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Underline those words. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You see, we're all prideful people. When God puts us through the furnace of affliction, He purges us, He removes these layers of pride in us. He breaks us. So that we may cease to sin. He Im removes these impurities in us. He makes us the way He wants us to be. As we continue in verse 2. They have ceased from sin so as to live the rest of their lives in the flesh. No longer for the lusts of men. But for the will of God. When we go through the affliction, of, uh, furnace of affliction, right? God transforms us. God changes us so that we are no longer living in the lusts of flesh. But we are living for the will of God. When God sovereignly allows difficult things in our life, when we commit ourselves to God's sovereignty, when we are persecuted, He carries us through. He changes us so that His purposes can be promoted. His name, through our, through our, through our transformation, His name can be made known to those in darkness. His purposes can be promoted. And that's why God allows in His sovereignty suffering in our lives. Dear brothers and sisters, I truly believe that persecution is coming. It's coming in our lifetime. It's coming to this country. We already are calling this, uh, this country post-truth country, post-modern country. The academia is by the day flooding young people who are against the true God. Persecution is coming. In this case, we see God rescuing. But God in His sovereignty may not do that. May not rescue us in this life. Someday will come, you and I ought to choose to give up our life. The question before us is, will you commit yourself to the sovereignty of God? Will you be ready to give up your life? We read in Matthew 10. The Lord Jesus saying to his disciples these words, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Daniel's friends understood this truth. If we die now, it's okay, we will live forever. But if we live now, we will die forever. They understood this truth. That's why they were willing to give up their life. The question before us is, are you willing to give up your life for the sake of the true and living God? 
Are you willing? Our brothers and sisters in China are willing to do that. Our brothers and sisters in Africa are willing to do that. Our brothers and sisters in Iran are willing to do that. Our brothers and sisters in India are willing to do that. The question is, are you willing to do that? In God's sovereignty, if He asks to give your life, are you willing to do that? If you are afraid of getting an F grade and willing to change your convictions, there is no way you, can, you are willing to give your life for the Lord. If you can do small things, you can never do such big things. Be faithful in the little things. Be a Christian. Gladly profess His name. Let the world persecute you. Who? This is the portion of the believer. Let the world persecute you. Even if we are to die for the name of Christ, it is a promotion to glory. It is a promotion to glory. John is looking into heaven. John is seeing this great throng, this great crowd in, John, in Revelation chapter 7. He's seeing this great crowd and there is this heavenly crowd worshipping the living and true God. Revelation 7.13 And one of the elders answered saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And from where have they come? Who are they? Who are these people in white robes? Where have they come from? And I said, John said to the elder, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of, of the great tribulation. These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They are in heaven. They have come out of this great tribulation, great trouble, great affliction. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have confessed His name. They have washed their sins. In the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15. For this reason they are before the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne shall spread His tabernacle over them. Who are these people? God spreads His tabernacle. Christ spreads His tabernacle over them. Who are these people? They have come out of the great tribulation. Verse 16, they shall hunger no more, nor neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. Verse 17, for the lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to the springs of the water of life. And God shall wipe every tear from their eyes. These people suffered in this life. They gave up their lives. They went to glory. They were promoted to glory. Dear ones, if we fail to profess the name of Christ in this world, we, are, no, we, we should examine our own salvation. The Lord Jesus says, whoever denies me before Men, I shall deny them before my Father who is in heaven. Let us confess his name. Let us not be afraid of false religion. Let us commit ourselves to this great God. Let us be persevering in the midst of trials. Let us understand Persecution is the cup of the believer. By God's grace, He will use our life 
for the promotion of his purposes God's kingdom will never end false religion will end false kingdoms will fall God's kingdom will never end let us be wise so that through through many tribulations we may enter the kingdom of God let us pray Father in heaven we worship thee we praise thee we thank thee that your word is living it speaks to us today the very things that happened 2500 years ago are happening right in front of us give us the visibility give us the spiritual illumination to see these things lord help us to understand that we are but strangers and pilgrims in this world traveling to the heavenly city give us grace lord that we would understand these spiritual things and willing to suffer for your name if it pleases thee lord and if it pleases thee that our lives poured out for you would bring you glory we pray oh god that you would use our you would help us to give our lives wholeheartedly to you we commit ourselves to you father i pray for a deeper work for myself and for everyone here help us to love christ to the extent of even giving our life in jesus precious name we pray amen